Hi, you're muted. Uh, there, I unmuted you. <laughs> like, I muted me? <laughs> yes, I did. Hold on. Why does this have a. Okay. Hi, how are you? I'm okay. I've had a crazy morning, but I. I okay, so basically, my phone cra crapped out on me last night, and it's totally my fault because I didn't update it or. Uh, you know, file my claim soon enough, but my intuition told me to, and I didn't listen. So oh, no. learning experience. It's fine. I've just been dealing with that all morning using my roommate's phone. So it's finally over and they should have a new phone ship to be by tomorrow. So oh, well, that's good. Yeah. Hopefully by tomorrow. We've been given a period of time of quiet. No, no phone, no phone for you. <laughs> Pretty much. I think that's what's happening. It's like cancel all your weekend plans. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. 
but yeah, just, totally. Let me turn off. I need to work. I need money so bad. <laughs> oh, right. Because your work is all through your phone for Lyft. Yeah. Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Mm. Yeah, it's okay. So that's how it's been. But oh, interesting. Hi, Suzanne. How are you? You're muted. I'll unmute you though. I got you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm hanging in there. That's where I am. <laughs> What's that? I'm I'm the frog. Yep. <laughs> uh, I'm just finishing writing a tab for somebody really quickly. So um, how so how are you doing? Do you have anything you want to share about? Do I have anything? Oh no. <laughs> I'm just kind of here. Um, I'm hanging in there. That's that's where I'm at. <laughs> well, I'll tell you guys, I've been sleeping a lot. I've been mostly sleeping for the last this whole week, honestly. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how anybody is able to do much more than that. So hats off to any of you guys who are still yeah. like, hanging out. Yeah. yeah, that is funny because a lot of the days this week, I hit like six o'clock and I think I'm done. I'm done. Oh. I am like, <laughs> done at 9 30. I can't I can't even think anymore. I'm like, I'm yeah. not even watching TV. It's been yeah, yeah. Intense. And I just um was talking with um or I mean I was listening to Mary um oh, Beekman, I think the last name is. She's a, she's known as the rock and roll psychic. She's like hmm. Uh, and she was saying how, um, you know, also saying she's been sleeping a lot, a lot of sleep needed. Um, and she said that, uh, you know, not only are we going into this new full moon, this next full moon cycle. Right. Tomorrow is a, there's something big going on. The galactic portals opening. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what she was talking about. And, um, and like, I get these, uh, but you know, Whenever I've worked with galactics really directly, you get the feel. It's very cold energy. Uh, it feels cold. That's one of the ways you can tell a difference between a galactic and angelic. Um, and it's very, very cold. And I have just been freezing, like freezing. And all of my stones are cold. Like all my crystals are colder than anything else you touch in the room. They're colder, uh, and I didn't even notice it till last night. Um, uh, Jackie was over, and she, uh, I showed one of my stones. Wanted her to touch it. Wanted to meet her. It was a new one, and I brought it over. And I was like, "This one wants to say hi." And she goes, "Oh my god, it is so cold, and I'm burning up." And I felt her hands. And normally, my hands are the hottest hands I feel. Hers felt like fire to me, and the crystal felt like ice. And she's like, "It feels really good." <laughs> So, um, I do think we are definitely going through some uh, really deep uh, awakenings. I think what was happening is we're having a lot of DNA activation going on, um, and that's the stuff that's making it so, you know, the 98, what, 99 point, or 98.9% .9 that's junk DNA, they say. Um, that is all the code that uh, runs the matrix for us, and that's being rewritten right now very strongly. And, and it has been, you know, for this whole year. But I think what's coming online right now is I think everybody's getting galactic codes coming online. Yeah. So um, I'm just noticing that. Last night at um, the energy group, we had two people new that have never worked with before. And curse energy was on the menu, and we were moving. curse energy. Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. They both had curse energy very heavily with them. Uh, in family like line. Other people or family members projecting that onto them. So, well, a curse energy is a projection, um, and it is a projection of self hatred. It's an externalized projection of self hatred. Um, and usually um, it's targeted, right? It can be ambivalent and just open, and it can be targeted. Um, it can be targeted to an individual. It can be targeted to a line, a family line, um, and then it can just be general and sweet. So um, I thought I'd check in with you guys and see, and um, you know, so this can be the discussion about that kind of energy. Um, 
uh, that we can post also in the group for other people to be able to check in with. So I have a question about that. Yeah, go for it. So I oftentimes have the feeling as if I am running up to take a, a leap and then I get to the point of doing it and I back up. And I've done this so often, it feels to me like a curse. <laughs> So just check in, check in with your compass. Is this part of a curse for me? Ask for a yes, ask for a no. Do I have curse energy in my field at all? Yes. All right. I I uh, so how about you, Laura? Uh, I don't think anymore. I, I do believe that there was at one point. If, if there is, I'm that aware. compass just to check in and see, do I still have any curse energy in my field? I'm not getting a yes with that. Good. So that'll be perfect. So um, then let's, afterward, I want to hear about how you believe and feel and work through your curse energy, because you did definitely have it in your field at one point. So it would be great to get your perspective, and we can talk about that after. Let's start by removing it. Uh, so uh, Suzanne and Laura both, since now we are being exposed again to it, what happens whenever you get the idea of a curse, like whenever you think, well, maybe I'm cursed or maybe that person's cursed or it's an intuition actually. And oftentimes it's true. Uh, so we don't directly work on it uh, as far as I've been trained. We don't personally work on it ourselves. We work on it with angelics. So think of four angelics that you, you like the first four that come to mind and call them down and ask them to protect you. If you ask them to protect you, if you have children, family, uh, partners, anyone that you are directly in a relationship to that comes to mind, you ask them to surround you with light. Like, so um, we use, I use Michael's sword of truth, which is actually a sphere of light. And I love to use this as a representation of it. So we use, Michael has the, the sword of truth, and this, what it does is it returns one back and restores one back to their core vibration, their true vibration. First energy isn't yours, it's someone else's, it's actually from someone else. So um, when we come back to core self, we release anything that's not. So this is always a beneficial thing to do whenever you feel like, I pick something up, or is someone around me? This is a great way to clear out and especially um, uh, all levels of your field, your energy field, your emotional body, your physical body, all of those fields. So um, what we do is we first ask them to protect us. We ask them to protect all that we own because curse energy is sticky. It's like the black goo. We have to think quarantine. So our home, our bank accounts, our credit cards, our jobs, our workplaces. Right? You can imagine this great big sphere that's holding all of that. So that as we start the removal process, it can't go anywhere. It's inside this sphere, this container. The container we're going to create for it is the violet flame. We we'll do so by... I'm going to try and get something bold enough for you guys to really be able to see. We start by drawing a teardrop around it. So we imagine all the people, things, places, things inside this teardrop, and we trace the teardrop three times. This is an alchemical symbol for the violet flame. So we circle, we create this three times, and then we draw the infinity symbol three times in the center, tracing it three times. And then we do an eternity, which is basically infinity turned on its edge, crossing it. See? Look at the corner. Three times. As you come in on the third point, you're asking all energy within this corner, this uh, uh, container, be transmuted back into divine frequency. 
You can use the violet flame for other things as well, but we'll talk about that later. So we put the, everything into the container of the violet flame, and then we bring, we ask for Michael's sword of truth. And we visualize it starting anywhere in your body you want to. I usually start in my heart. And visualize it scaling and growing from that point and continuing to grow all the way until it's filling the container. But starting with you. Now, if you feel you have a family curse, if your curse was on a familial line using your compass, check in. Is this anchored into my family line? Is it inherited? If yes, how many generations back? Less than five? Less than 10? 13. So we go and we contain 13 generations back in our violet flame container. We don't look at what it is, what the source of it is, where it came from, how it impacted us yet. First, we clear it. And again, bringing that sphere of truth back, we, we visualize the family line. Starting at the beginning, the 13th generation back, and allowing that light to come through. The light is transmuting all energy back to divine frequency that is not of your family line. Feeling it physiologically. Yours is a deep one, Suzanne. So um, as we're doing so, imagine that you're flooding your body with that golden light. Michael's sort of truth is burning out that frequency. It's like pulling it back out and it's just divine light. But the spaces that are left in you, the family members, that void is filled with golden light. As though you're a honey bear and sources liquid honey gold energy is just pouring down into you. Golden. Filling all those pockets and spaces with the golden light. Wow, that's really weird. It turned gold. I know. That's why I love this thing. <laughs> that is pretty wild. It's actually a moon. It is actually, yeah, it is. It actually, whoa. And you can dim it. Whoa. <laughs> Where's the music coming from? Suzanne, she's at Rock and Frog. Oh. At Rock and Frog. <laughs> Just suddenly started. I was like, "What?" <laughs> so let's see. So now, um, just check in. Have I cleared all of this energy from me and my line? See how light you feel already. It feels like it needs to work a little while. All right. So we'll just leave that in process and ask now: Is it important for me to understand the nature of my curse? No. So let it go. Mm -hmm. If it is important and relevant, then you start investigating the same way we just did. Okay. And it's going to be your intuition that's going to be asking the questions. And when we start with the compass going yes and no questions, we get on a line where it's like yes, 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 yes. And then it's like, okay, now you're in the stream. You're in the feed of that. You don't have to keep questioning it. Try to receive it. And that builds the strength of your receiving your connection of your own guidance. Mm -hmm. So yes and no is getting you tuned into it. Cleans you up of what's blocking you from hearing it. Okay, so um, that's how we handle curse energy. Um, there are some people who believe you return energy back to the sender. I think that's kind of like giving someone back a cold. Um, you know, um, I personally, I, I, I was trained how to work with curses, and my teacher was like, most people shouldn't work with curses. I disagree. I think that it's something we all need to own is because we all have the capacity of doing it. It is focused, fixated self-hatred or externalized hatred that is masked, you know, self-hatred masked as externalized. Um, and so there are things that we get really hateful about. I mean, it's part of human nature. Um, 
that I could be in the most. I'm going to just mute you for a second, Suzanne, because that's so loud. Um, so I can be in the most enlightened and spiritual groups, and you drop a word like Trump, and you can see exactly how much self-hatred um, will be externalized in that room. Uh, so we have such a, a justification around some aspects of this, and then we have um, self-punishment around it. Uh, and especially if we are working with source energy, our goals, our soul's goal is to serve humanity, which never happens by hating it or vilifying it or separating from it more and more. Um, so the, it's, I think this is the most important time for us to be very aware of, of curse energy, of that frequency of externalized hatred, of believing that someone else is the problem and if they were dead or they were gone or they were whatever that your life would be better in some way um, and this is like it's not uh it, it's it's easy like for instance i used to feel like we needed anyone who was convicted of a sex offender crime should just be sent to an island and i was like we could call it pedophile isle they can all just live there we'll sterilize them so no more children are involved in it and they can just do whatever the fuck they're gonna do with each other. If, you, if you're somebody who's gonna violate someone else sexually, you get to go live there. And you know, if you can survive it, great. That was, that was what I believed. And I thought that would be perfect placed in South Africa because they've got lots of great whites, so they're not gonna swim anywhere. And I was just like, I mean, I had it in my head and it was intense and strong. And I ended up becoming um, best friends with the woman who was the clinical coordinator for sex offenders in Multnomah County. And she would call them my boys. And, uh, and her job was, you know, treating these guys. And, and she'd be the first to say it's not treatment, it's actually rather um, the, uh, maintenance, they call it. Um, but, uh, you know, and she would talk to me about these guys. And, and I'd, ha I'd have to find compassion for these people. And, and at first it was like, it was through the vehicle of, I'm just grateful you're dealing with them. I'm just grateful that you can do this. I'm grateful you're there. You know, um, I'm, I, let me feed you dinner because, you know, you know, it's my eyes. You're the eyes on the, on, on the problem. And thank you for doing that. Um, but as time progressed, I, uh, I developed more and more compassion for these people, recognizing they're wounded people, just like my own molester was wounded, just like I'm wounded. Um, and it, it deepened my compassion and it released me from that cycle of, of that hatred piece. So um, we can be as justified as we think we are in hating somebody and thinking that it's okay. But what we are doing literally is projecting curse energy at someone when we're doing that. Uh, and, you know, Trump right now is, is probably getting more of that coming at him than ever before. Uh, and a lot of people have said in the, in the community that Trump's a walk-in uh, and that actually three years ago, uh, well, now it would be five years ago, uh, a, another consciousness walked in. It was part of Trump's agreement to get himself to a position where he could become elected and then a walk-in would come in and take over. Um, and it's interesting if you feel into that energetically, uh, into him and into all of that. And I have no idea why all this is coming out right now, but I'm just gonna say it because it is. Uh, but if you tune into that energetically, it's like there's a, a very strong shield around him. And it's not like an evil shield as far as I can tell. It's like as everyone sends their hatred towards him, it's, it's like it's just being burned up. The, the, I would think that the White House would be full of dark negative energy right now with how many people are sending that there, right? But it's not. It's, it's very, still very bright and light. Uh, and, and I'm not saying her government doesn't have darkness and doesn't have dark energy. It's just, that's not the source of it. He's really serving as this mecha, uh, uh, um, uh, like a magnetic pull of all of these aspects of humanity in our culture, in our culture that have to be brought forward and can't be in the, in the, in the recesses anymore. We have to see people expressing their hatred openly rather than that seeding hatred that's in the background because that's why our country's dying of cancer and heart disease it's 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 killing us as people uh, so if we can get it out you know whether we're talking about it or we're just 
sending it out. And that's what's happening with curse energy. The, the urge is to get it out, right? It's awful. It feels awful. Um, so uh, what we have forgotten as a race to do is to get it out to God, right? We get it out to each other and we send it to each other, but we don't send it back to source, to source, to learn from, to grow from, so it doesn't have to keep repeating the lesson. I view that as a big part of why we are in a cycle of this continuing uh, repetition of, of these same patterns. Uh, if you read in the Law of One, it talks a lot about, it discusses that we're in the time of harvest right now. Uh, the harvest period is, um, is when <clears throat> there are three harvests that occur per cycle. Uh, each cycle of development is, the, uh, is the, the density range of exploration. The first density range of exploration was the exploration of physical matter assembling itself, which was the creation of stars, planets, systems, uh, this really base level of things being organized. That was the first division away from source. That's where we get major hierarchical consciousnesses, consciousnesses of stars and planets and lunar bodies, uh, those, those celestial consciousnesses. The second division of source occurred, and that was what we call second density. That's the exploration of separation while of uh, where it's uh, elemental building, right? So now we're looking at water, earth, uh, water, earth, fire, and air consciousnesses, and the first explorations of uh, individuation from main consciousnesses, right? Um, so we start getting things like um, tree consciousnesses, which is a collective consciousness uh, with individuations that believe themselves to be a collective, right? A tree doesn't think of itself as the I am. Um, it's still a part of the forest, right? Though it functions in its own way. Um, so the, the second density exploration, third density exploration, which is what we are now completing, the harvest cycle is, is finishing up, is separation from source as an individuation with no, no belief, not knowing you're a part of the collective. Uh, and that's what is the consciousness of most animals and humans, right? That's where we're at. We're somewhere between third density and fifth density in consciousness, most of us. So um, third density was the exploration that Earth was going through at, over the last uh, 225,000 years. Uh, and 75,000 years ago, there was the first, uh, the first harvest that occurred. The harvest periods are where source goes through and looks for any components of source or uh, individuations that have completed the journey of the cycle and are still working in the system. Uh, it's it, the, the idea that we will automatically, once we're done learning here, will incarnate out isn't actually the way that the system works. It's more like we get plugged into this matrix. We're here until the clear out happens. The clear outs are um, like disk defrags, basically. Source calling through. If there's some consciousnesses that are ready to move on into fourth and fifth density exploration, they will. Um, but sometimes the consciousness will choose to stay and teach here in this density. They, they, they've like learned something. They're like, well, the rest of the game hasn't learned this. And if I leave right now, then the game's going to miss what I know, and it needs what I know, actually. So that's why there's so many ascended masters and, uh, and other consciousnesses that are birthed in right now, because we're at the end of the third density exploration of Earth. It's the final calling that's happening. So now, what's instead of, instead of going through and sweeping through and finding those who are ready to transition into fourth density, now the sweep through is, Who's not done with third density? Anyone who's not done exploring third density is going to be dying in our reality, and they're going to be going into another incarnation cycle at another planet that is still exploring third density consciousness, because Earth isn't anymore. So there's nowhere left for them to work through their lessons. So Earth and all planetary bodies, but especially Earth, are like an orphanage of many different races and species who had to continue third density exploration. Now, third density exploration, wherever you look in any culture, 
uh, uh, and by culture I'm talking galactic culture, they all, they all struggle with third density. This is the hardest because we have forgotten in third density that we are the creators of it. And that's the hardest thing to remember when you're the experiencer. So this lesson set, it's just so difficult. And it's exceptionally difficult in Earth because of the end, I think, in our galactic system of, of the Milky Way, because we are working in a polarized system. It's polarized, and that forces us to, it's the, the natural expression is to pull away. And that's what makes it so hard. Every time we feel we're connecting, this pull away happens. And, and learning to use that and manipulate that and, and not be victimized by that, that's a huge part of it. So um, yeah, clearing out curse energy is clearing out these genetic lines. So the ones that are left behind, they, as they continue forward, we're not still carrying those vibrational frequencies of the past of that third density exploration. It's like bringing a virus from an old system to your Macintosh, right? Um, so we wanna to try to just clear all that stuff out. That's uh, really very quite important right now. Uh, so anyone who, it, I'm, and, and you'll notice because if it's a curse, what will happen is first you'll think, God, that's funny, I just totally thought of a curse energy. And it could be anything, like any kind of curse reference that you can think of, or somebody keeps bringing it up to you. I had it brought up to me like four times before bringing it up last night, uh, in the last two days. So um, I know I don't have any personally, but it's time to clear it out again. We did this with Morning Oasis too, um, two years ago. We did a big clear out as well. Um, so uh, uh, as we're as we're working on clearing it out, and I just lost it. I was going to say, Morning Oasis. Yeah. Um, Ah, uh, so once we clear the line out, then it's very important to um, invite source to come back in and rewrite our programming, right? Rewrite our divine blueprint into optimum for us moving forward. Because this is something um, that's very heavy and will pull you down into third density. Uh, so as you propel forward into fourth and fifth density, and, and when I say that, I'm talking the difference between physicality and consciousness. Our consciousness is in fifth density. Our physical is in fourth density right now. And so we're in this, this is the expression. And I know that's a lot of terms that may or may not help you right now, um, but people call it third 3D and 5D. And a lot of people in the energy community are confusing density from dimension. So you'll hear third dimension, fourth dimension, that's different. That's not the same thing as density. And it's okay, um, but just know for yourself that what you're, really, what you're doing is releasing the programming from a whole game system that you're moving out of and you're going into a new system, right? So you wanna have your character upgraded for the system is what you're doing, basically. Um, so uh, your avatar. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's just take a moment and we're gonna do some blueprint work on our DNA, which is where we work at that level. The DNA is the basis for everything we experience. So there's lots of different ways you can do blueprint work. You can either visualize a piece, a strand, a full strand of your DNA. For me, my palms are very much involved. I rub my palms together, activating my chakras. Opening my palms for me creates a field I'm working in. And I open my palms, visualizing my strand of DNA within them. Uh, there are other people who um, use uh, physical things to represent it. You know, they'll use a crystal. This is representing my DNA. So it's something they can tangibly hold. If you need that more than just a visualization, you can do that as well. So we're visualizing our DNA as a strand. And we're sending it up to source, I view it like I ask source to show me the plug point, right? Or like something along those lines. To me, it's like plugging a disc into the drive and asking source to rewrite, reprogram, release old programming from the old matrix, upgrade, whatever terms work for you. 
optimize my vibration, activate all aspects and components of my DNA, my energy, my expression that will support me in this exploration and transition into fourth and fifth density. Some of us are even to sixth density consciousnesses, inhabiting the fifth density, exploring fourth density reality. We're going to activate all aspects of this. So transitions are smooth. Just like as singers, we learn how to transition between our registers. We're now going to be practicing transitioning between these densities. They are just, it's, it's an octave, basically. It's the octave of the expression of source. So we're opening ourselves not only to explore the source all the way up to the top octave of eight, back down through to one. We're exploring the range of expression. So we ask all vibrations at, to be activated that support us in this. Cleaning off and clearing all karmic debris inherited by family, inherited through personal experience through the cycles, or brought in in this creation. Releasing that and returning to source. And when it's done, like a little turkey timer or disc, it just pops out. The way I work with it is I imagine myself just picking it up and plugging it into my heart. Plug it into my heart because my heart beats my frequency. Every beat radiates my frequency. So with every beat of my heart, I'm reprogramming all the DNA throughout my body. Whenever we do a reprogramming of DNA, we must flush and cleanse. Because literally what will hap what's happening internally in your cells is your cells now are rewriting, making new DNA to represent this symbol. And the old RNA, the pieces, of your old DNA and DNA are debris now. It's garbage in the cell. So the cell pushes it out. Yeah? Hold on. What, what so is, is it that you flesh out your DNA? What, what do you need to do? So that's, that's what I'm gonna share. So the, there's, you have to physiologically support it and energetically support it, okay? So we'll start with energetically so we can clean that, finish that out. Energetically, we support it by visualizing a, a flowing, I do an, an, I call it an angelic rainbow waterfall. And I visualize that waterfall flowing down through my head and the water is like opalescent and clean and pink in energy for me. Uh, it can be anything. Whatever colors you need it to be will be, right? That's basically vibrations of of frequency for me usually pink is universal love frequency so I that whenever I'm doing this that's the frequency I tend to see green is a healing energy green is healing and restoring right golden energy is what's coming through a lot right now from the um, from our Sun from from source um, we're getting a lot of golden vibration right now as well that's allowing us to envelop our individuation that's an individuation frequency um, helping you love and relish the honey bear you are right like <laughs> so um, we visualize that pink rainbow waterfall flowing through us as though our cells are little floating uh little floating inner tubes on a great big sea of us and that water is flushing through all of it, cleansing the waters, cleansing the cells. And so that will support your body in the flushing process energetically. Now to support it physiologically, lots of tea, lots of water, 
especially water right now. Waters keep the lymphatic system flowing. Uh, the other thing you want to do is um, lots of alkaline foods because as your body is expelling things, your pH is going to start fluctuating. And you're going to potentially, whenever we really detox this way, we tend to get sick. Like I got really sick after Saturday's energy lab. <clears throat> yeah. And, and that was a big part of the, my stomach bug. Not because anybody made me sick, but I released stuff that was stored and my intestines were like, I got to flow that shit out. That's got to go. So I could sit there and think, oh, I'm ill, I'm, I've got a bug, or I could think somebody gave me something, or any number of things. But the reality is, I was releasing. And it's crazy. Like, I can feel it. My abdomen is smaller. It's, it's ridiculous. I released so much from that. And that's where we hold the identity stuff, right? So that's what we were working on in that, was all identity stuff. All, all of that. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so uh, physiologically. So we support it. Keep you trying to keep ourselves alkaline. Yeah? Alkaline foods. Uh, so alkaline rich foods. Um, greens, anything green tends to be pretty uh, alkaline. Um, the, uh, the things you want to avoid are the obvious ones because they're sugar, white flour, those things um, and white flower uh, flowers because they um, their surface area is so small they absorb very quickly they convert very quickly those are the things that grow bacteria you're already dumping a lot of debris into the system so the bacteria have more food so you're kind of what you're imagining is you're starving them out another thing that i absolutely love and adore for this stuff uh, is the total gut restore by dr gundry um total restore this stuff is great for supporting uh, any of that kind of stuff uh, it has all sorts of things in it that are um that help you stay not just alkaline but that help absorb lectins in your food help heal the gut lining um, and our guts are, are suffering as a, as a people right now, mostly because of the things that have been put into our foods that we didn't even know about until we were getting sick from them. Uh, so we're purging a lot of that stuff right now. Um, other alkaline rich foods. So you can get water that is alkalinized water. Uh, there's water bottles that you can get that are alkalinized, uh, that will alkalinize water. Um, so that's another way you can work on that. Our natural pH is 7.2. That's optimum for us. You can get pH strips and just test your own pH by touching it to your tongue and see where you're at in alkalinity. Uh, and um, yeah, so you want that number, you don't like, sometimes we get up to 7.4 um, and that's like a very sugary, rich acidic environment that helps bacteria grow so people who have a lot of inflammation or high bacteria content they'll tend to have a higher ph um, uh, so the, the, those are some of those those things you can do uh, to support the other part that you want to support is your building material right so you you think of your body as a construction site you need the components that you to build with so we want to eat things that are like uh, high in minerals, right? So like chia seeds or seed, like seeds and nuts, those things are like these little nutrient packets designed to get a plant started, right? So um, very powerful force, seeds. Um, uh, fresh fruits, uh, fresh, uh, fresh vegetables, a higher concentration of, of of the green vegetables right now is better. Um, the reason uh, fresh is better than cooked at this point as, as a general rule is because there's just more nutrients involved in it and the fibers are, uh, are, are less soluble. So they help clean that debris out more. Your lymphatic systems are flushing. So the lymphatic support is, important, is critical. You want to get lots of that. So we do that by, again, lots of fluids, staying very hydrated. Now, that does not look like chugging a bunch of water. 
we have to be constantly sipping it throughout the day. When we drink large volumes of water at a time, it flushes our kidneys and, and it causes our body to flush it out. Um, so it's, it doesn't actually help with any of that. Um, it's, uh, it makes it harder for our systems. So it's better to be sipping water through the day. Lemon water, lemon cucumber water, water with a touch of salt in it, all of those things are great for helping you stay alkaline as well uh, and keeping yourself hydrated. Lemon supports the detoxing in your liver and in your kidneys. Um, uh, uh, if you are feeling, some people are getting bladder infections right now or feeling that in that, that area, uh, there's the two things I know of that are really great for that are you know cranberry juice or there's a cran extract you can do that has that component uh, in a capsule form so you don't have to drink a lot of cranberry juice. Another thing that's good for that is boiling corn silk in water and drinking the corn silk water. Um, <coughs> so it's the water. So those are all things you can do to support that. Super greens are great. Did you want to ask something, Laura? So no magic mushrooms is what you're saying, right? Uh, well, I don't hear that that's a problem. I don't think I... Um, For like purging. So there's a lot of new research into mushrooms. Uh, and, there's, and, and so if you're talking about the psilocybin mushrooms specifically, um, let me just tune into that. I, I haven't used any of those things, so I'm just going to tune into that for a second to answer your question. So uh, what I hear is that those are not necessarily supportive in like detoxing. But what they are supportive is um, in uh, breaking belief patterning that's running. Uh, and belief patterning uh, can uh, unconsciously support the body in holding on to things that it would be better for it to detox and purge. So I guess in that way it could support. With um, intention. Yeah, with intention for sure. Uh, with intention and a, and a practice to it, you know. Um, but there are, but I am also hearing, but there's other mushrooms that would do a much better job of that. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. So um, I don't know what they are. Hmm. I don't know those names because I don't. So the way source and spirit energy works is if we don't have it in our database of consciousness and awareness, they, they can't put it in there. You know, it's, it's, it's coming from a, some aspect of what we already know. Um, it's, it's like I couldn't tell you what a, um, if, this, if spirit is asking me to tell you that an apple pie, somebody who bakes apple pie is coming to visit you, uh, and I've never seen or know what an apple pie is, I'm not going to be able to say it's an apple pie. I'll, I'll be like, well, there's these fruit in it that they cut up in these little slices, and they put it in this thing, and it's kind of juicy, but not, and it gets hot, and it's kind of crusty, but squishy, I, you know, I mean, I maybe know what a pastry is, and it's kind of like that, you know, so that's how it works, so I'm seeing some mushrooms, I don't know what their names are, <laughs> I'm seeing them in pictures, they're like white with red dots on them, I don't know what that is. The fly agar, or the, yeah, I know what those are. Okay. Um, well, I'm seeing those, I, and I don't know that I wouldn't say to eat those. I'm not saying that, yeah, but I think they're really there's, poisonous. Yeah, there's a vibration in there though that could be uh, used supportively. So, uh, like tuning in. Yeah. So there's like a a, a a vibration within that plant that can be used to help support detoxing, and it's part of why they're saying that's that's why it's in the fairy tales. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like the most beautiful red and white spotted mushroom but I, I think it's yeah. the fly agaris family but that's not the actual name of the mushroom itself yeah anyway i've never i've been afraid of that one i haven't actually <laughs> just like yeah, don't eat it probably. yeah i don't think you're supposed to eat it i don't know i think you can die if you eat it honestly they they had them um in the fall they had them growing on by the parking lot at pcc they were incredible they, and they were just like the ones in fairy tales wow and a student of mine said that you can you can eat them but you have to know what you're doing yeah you know that they are part of the, the magic mushroom family but you kind of have to know how to prepare them in order for them to not be poisonous have you guys noticed that your sweat 
smells worse. Yeah, you're detoxing. <laughs> yeah, it's really bad. I'm like, Okay. So that's another way you can know that's happening is because when we are detoxing, um, the two organs we detox the most through are our skin and our lungs. That's that's the most detoxing. Uh, so it, it's through the pores of our skin that we're expelling a lot of this debris. Yeah. And you know, I'm sure it probably doesn't help to drink or smoke weed. Does that make your sweat smell bad or slow down the process of detoxing or is this completely different and it's okay to smoke? Completely different. Um, alcohol, you want to avoid alcohol. Um, tobacco you want to avoid. Uh, okay. White sugar, white sugar, corn syrup, out. But I can smoke hella weed is what you're saying. That's fine. That's what they tell me. I'm a stoner though. So you're, you're getting it through my filter and my filter's like, smoke up. In fact, in fact <laughs> I have students bringing me weed right now as gifts. <clears throat> oh, oh, yeah, it's, it's all good for me. <laughs> oh, I got to have something. Something's coming through. I got to have something. <laughs> But man, I stink. I'm like, every day I stink. I took a bath last night. I stink right now. What the hell? What were you going to say, Suzanne? Have you heard of ketamine, which I think was called Special K on the street? But I, I was reading a whole bunch of things last night about it because um, a couple of people have said that it's it's a treatment and a cure for depression. I've heard that too, yeah. Uh, but it's something that you have to, like, you go to a place and they, they inject it intravenously. And it takes, like, four to six treatments. Wow. You heard? But, uh, but it was, sounded really interesting because it was, like, it's, like, controlled tripping. Well, basically, my, like, right now, microdosing is, is they're, they're learning so much about that. Yeah. Um, and I was just at a, a fair in Salem, and there's a woman there who sells ayahuasca in a microdose. And that's being used for treating depression and anxiety as well. Uh, and it's not enough where you get high on it at all. Uh, it's just enough. Um, it's, it's a microdose. So microdosing, um, that, that is becoming more and more of a thing. Um, and, you know, the whole thing is, is that uh, LSD, uh, the psilocybin, uh, all these drugs were developed by our government uh, in, in, in seeking ways to treat their soldiers because soldiers were struggling and suffering with all these different problems. And they, and they were trying to create soldiers that wouldn't have those problems. Uh, and so it was, it was a, you know, all of that stuff was for treatment. It, and, it, and LSD was incredibly effective, very powerful. Um, and, and in fact, Timothy Leary uh, was, he, he was trying to get everybody to understand the truth of this. And he really got vilified by the, you know, the war on drugs after, um, after the, you know, uh, the transition occurred and the government started selling our, our, wanting to sell these drugs to us instead of, um, you know, prescribing them to us, right? It was easier, more destructive. And that's, we could go down that road, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, but yes, so LSD and um, I ha the ketamine, I had heard something about that, but I didn't. Do you have any take on that? On what? Ketamine. Well, let me just tune into it because it's not one that I've looked into much. I just remember seeing something about that too. Um, So yeah, basically what I'm sensing is that when you, uh, what ketamine does is it activates your glands, certain glands, releasing, you know, chemical hormones. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's setting a new level of hormonal uh, processes. So the, it's for people who have depression, generally uh, they're saying now the depression is caused by a fungal infection or, um, or there's all kinds of different, um, 
other ideas of things. So we're starting to realize that we have more fungus in our body than we thought, and that those influence us in so many ways. So what I'm hearing is that ketamine, in some way, uh, it, it counters or neutralizes the transmissions that are happening as a result of the balance of your hormonal system. As a result of infectious things. That's cool. Ooh, interesting. And then I also am seeing, it's like I'm feeling in my brain as I tune into it. Yeah, it's releasing, yeah. It's basically, it stimulates your pineal gland. It starts releasing DMT in your system, which is a, a powerful tool, right? That's a very powerful tool for consciousness. Uh, it gives you a of very purpose. <laughs> you know, all kinds of things. Um, I'm also sensing that it's, it's impacting my um, my hypothalamus. I think um, and I'm feeling it starting to impact my digestive system. So it, it impacts your neurophysiology. And that's that's where depression is, is also impacting, is what I'm getting. <laughs> but it is a, it's one of those it's one of those substances where you know, if it's not coupled with treatment while you're doing that, then it will become a replacement. Uh, the, it's, it's just like if you go and get a massage from someone and you're not aware of why those muscles are fatiguing and having those issues. With connection. So you never adjust your care, you never adjust your work environment, you never adjust your physiology. So you'll have to keep going back for it. You'll have to keep going back for it. So, if we, and this is the same for the, uh, the as well, uh, and the same for weed as well, although they're also telling you weed is a counter. Like, it's so mild on the body, it's something you can ingest pretty regularly without any problem. Um, whereas the other ones, they're much smaller doses, and we tend to take it, is what I'm hearing of these different things. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if herbs if you look at where herbs are you know now they have they've reinvented the pyramid the food pyramid right um, and so herbs are critical to have in every day but you only need a tiny bit of them they're powerful yeah, but you do need them so it's kind of like that i'm seeing so it's we, we we tend to take more if we do it on our own uh, than we would if it's being done for us and we don't have tend to have the discipline to stay uh, focused and using it most people don't say ceremony for themselves they're better at ceremony with others so uh, that all of those things are big important components around the use of any of those kinds of things um, just making I'm also seeing three thoughts is this frog, frog medicine coming frog medicine it's some sort of blog medicine that would be supported for some people at this point. Uh, yeah. Have you heard of this? Yes, I have. Um, you, it's pretty intense, though. I hear that. Um, because you um, you have to burn it in your skin. It's like you, the part of the way of administering it involves basically they, they burn your skin to get it into it. And then you have um, really intense um, nausea and um, for about, I don't know how long, <laughs> but it's pretty intense. It's, it's a I think there's hurt. another way. I, I think there might be another way if you can look in and research some other ways. Yeah, yeah, because that one is pretty, you know, that's pretty hardcore. I mean, yeah, I don't see, I'm not seeing that that's what's necessary. I, I don't see that you need it. I mean, I'm not seeing that. Uh -huh. um, but the ketamine was interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm not clinically depressed, which is what most people are talking about. But, you know, it's been kind of off and on. I mean, I, I, I don't hear that it would hurt you, but I don't hear that that's the solution for you either. Mm, interesting. Okay, thanks. Uh, for me. Uh, but always trust your own instincts. Use your compass, check in with it, will this support you? It could also be not right now. Uh, it could be at another time it might be. 
Um, it could be that it would have been what was very help would have been very helpful for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so your body's like, well, we could have done that. I mean, it could. Be that. <laughs> right. um, I'm not really sure. There's there's uh, there's a few different layers in there of that, of different aspects of that. If that makes sense. Um, okay, so um, violet flame. So the other way we can use the violet flame. Um, the violet flame is a powerful tool. Whenever you are experiencing um, conflict, discomfort. Now, uh, the first and most important thing to remember is discomfort is your lessons. Discomfort equals lesson trying to get your attention, right? So make sure that when you're using the violet flame, you're not um, just trying to avoid your lessons, but it's very supportive uh, if you know what the lesson is, right? And you're just looking to find a way to ease your frustration or ease your resistance or whatever. Um, so I'll give some examples of how I've used the violet flame. So uh, I was riding on a plane back from Boston. Uh, it was a long flight. And uh, the, as soon as I boarded, the woman who sat right in front of me, she came on and sat down and put her chair all the way back, like right into my lap. We hadn't even taken off yet. And every time I moved, I'd bump her chair and she was getting so angry at me. And I'm like, oh God, this is gonna be a nightmare. This is not gonna be a good flight. I was kind of like, and I already was stressed out and nervous about it because the last time I'd flown back from Boston, we had an emergency landing and engine failure and it was terrifying. So I was already like, <sighs> you know? <laughs> And, um, and so then the stewardess came, a flight attendant, and she was giving water, and she ended up spilling water on the lady, and the lady just lost it on the, on, and I've never even seen a flight attendant spill anything on anyone ever, but she spilled a lot of water. <laughs> um, and Pull off, lady. I know, <laughs> and I kind of giggled, you know, but then she just really lost it, and the two of them were like starting to, and I was just like, oh God, I just can't take it. And I was very, very sensitive at that point. My, my bra had so many stones in it, I can't even tell you. I probably had like an extra 10 pounds of rocks on my body. I even had things, uh, I even, I'm not even shitting about this. See how big this thing is? This used to be tucked right here, another one tucked here, a huge big giant quartz point that was like this big in between my boobs, things under my boobs. I, I'm not kidding, and this was how I could get through anywhere because I picked everything up. I mean, somebody walks in and they're insecure. I've got that. I know what they're overly inflated about. I knew what they were sad about. I mean, I, it was like too much information. So anyway, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I can't do this. I cannot take this. This is horrible. And, um, and, and they showed me the violet flame and I remembered the violet flame. So I visualized myself, this woman, the flight attendant in that chamber. And all I asked was all vibrations within be restored to their optimum. That's all I ask. And that's usually the only thing I ask when I use the violet flame. When I was trained to use the violet flame, that I was trained to use it by saying, Transmute all anger into love. Transmute all fear into love. Uh, transmute all insecurity into confidence. I mean, to, to name these things and to be uh, in command of it, uh, that works. But I'm working through my filter at that point. I may not know what optimum actually is. I may not know. So I may, um, and somebody else's may be different than mine, right? So to me, just asking it to be restored to optimum vibration is a submission and asking source to take care of it. That's how I view that when I say that. I'm like, I'm asking God to give us all what we need right now. Just bring what, what is needed here now. Um, so I did that within about two, three minutes. It was fast. I hear her sleeping. She's snoring. She slept the whole flight. And uh, she woke up about 20, 30 minutes before we landed. Um, just as they do that announcement and started dropping down. And when she woke up, she was, she, she apologized to everybody for being so cranky. And she revealed that she was returning from the East Coast because her son had been in an accident. Uh, and she'd been at the, at, in the ICU with him for the last two weeks and wasn't sure if he was going to survive and was just coming back to Portland to wrap up some things so she could go back and actually be there 
until whatever it was that was going to happen with him. So she was in a very bad place. And, uh, and she said, you know, when she woke up that she needed that sleep, she was like, God, I, I haven't, I haven't really even slept in two weeks, you know? So, um, so the, the violet flame allowed me to let go of being angry at her <laughs> enough to just not care that she's laying in my lap and be like, well, I'm in a bumper, you know, <laughs> it's just what's going to happen. It released me from my own anxiety, my own fear, my own uh, idea that I'm supposed to be taking care of this person now. I can't let them be angry, you know, all that stuff. That's what was working on in me. Um, and in her, obviously, it was providing a relief from all the things that had been overwhelming her. So that's one way I've used the violet flame. Another way I used the violet flame was Sloss was going to school in, uh, in this, I think he was in third grade at this point. And he was having, there was a little boy in his class who had Tourette's. And he, his, well, he was diagnosed with Tourette's. Um, I am not a doctor, but I don't think he had Tourette's. I think that what he has uh, is total and complete entitlement. His parents are lesbian women who had him through surrogacy, uh, and the primary mother of him who is taking care of him isn't the one who birthed him. And she was the first one to tell you, I didn't give birth to that little asshole. Uh, and their, the way they treated him uh, was to ignore him until he was so bad uh, that you had to do something. Um, and so he learned really quickly that the way he gets what he wants is through physical pain. And he would just, you know, uh, beat up his mother uh, when she didn't do what he wanted. Um, he had no boundaries. Uh, he was, he had no, and, and like Tourette's, I've, I've met people with Tourette's and yeah, they have problems with tics and they have problems with shouting out language, but their, their demeanor isn't, it's not like they're mean people, you know? Um, and this kid would hide in the bathroom and hit kids, uh, just hide there and, and then hit them as they walk, tried to go to the bathroom. You know, he'd tuck under and hit their legs while they're trying to pee and things and just crazy things. So like Tourette's doesn't make you calculate how you're going to hurt somebody, right? So there was all kinds of stuff that was going on. Well, Spass, he hated this kid. <laughs> he hated the kid. He hated that the school was putting up with it. Anytime the school tried to discipline the kid, then they would have, um, the parents would threaten to sue because the parents were um, very, very wealthy Jews from the East Coast who lived on trust funds, and it was this whole level of entitlement, and it's 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 it was the craziest thing, um, and the school had to actually get legal counsel to finally get be able to get him out of the school. He was so destructive, um, and so Sloss was in third grade. He was he had been in class with this boy for three years, four years, four years, and he was done. Like he was so fed up that he was like, I'm going to tell on him every time he does something. Every time. Because these adults aren't protecting any of us. And so I'm, I'm done. I'm done. And so he would. Well, the teacher said that Sfoss's sense of justice was getting in the way of him being a good student. And so she was sick of hearing Sfoss complain about it, didn't want to hear it anymore from him, because she was powerless. She couldn't do anything about it. The boy was powerless. Like the, he was already in his whole whatever. So I just started surrounding the school with the violet flame, the whole school. Uh, and, and like the boy was infamous. Like it's a K through eight school. Everyone knew who this boy was. That's just how hard he was to be around. Uh, so I just visualized this violet flame and, and I included his parents in it. I included myself. I included Sposs, you know, um, and put us all in there and just, and every morning when Sposs would leave for school, I would just visualize this violet flame. Well, it was probably, I want to say maybe a month after that, I started doing that, that um, Sposs came home and said that Jacob was gone, that he, he's not at the school anymore. And that his parents had put him into another school that um, was more uh, suitable for him. And we didn't even see Jacob for a few years, you know, and then he, now he's, he comes and hangs out after school at the back and he's much better. Um, because the school that he went to was 
smaller and able to handle just him, you know, and, um, and focus in on, on whatever it was that was going on with him, but apparently he's still an asshole, but you know, now he's a 15 year old asshole. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so that was another way I used the violet flame. When my ex and I would have a fight, uh, I would use the violet flame before I wanted, before I would go and try to talk to him about what I was upset about or what I was angry about because it would always invariably bring me to a space where I was, instead of wanting to tell him what he did wrong, I was ready to take accountability for myself after doing the violet flame. Beforehand, my focus is what's what he did wrong. So these are just some examples of using it. Um, you can use it on food. You can use it um, you know, before you eat something, visualizing, that's something else I kind of tend to do, uh, is just visualize. I don't use necessarily the violet flame, I just, see this sphere of golden loving light around my food or my drinks, you know? Um, but so those are just, the, they're concepts, right? That help you focus your energy in a certain way or submit in a certain way uh, or transmute, right? So, okay. Yeah. That's about that, that end feed. Anything else? Do you guys have any questions about that? Yeah. Like, is your language important? Do you use positive uh, language only? Like, for example, um, just off the top of my head, you know, imagining a violet sphere around, um, you know, my girlfriend who's in Arizona right now on a big biking trip, like, I want to set an intention for her that she comes back safely, that she has a healing journey, that she has a wonderful uh, experience, like, you're just saying whatever you want, or are there really great... Um, well, I could think of a couple of things there that could counter each other, right? Mm -hmm that you said. I want her to have a, okay, Suzanne, love you. Um, uh, so you don't, you said, I want her to have come back safely, uh, have a healing journey. And what was the other thing? Uh, to have a, a great experience. And a great experience. Uh -huh. um, so um, what is safe? Nothing. <laughs> Uh, and what is healing? Usually pain. And, and a great experience? It's memorable. <laughs> I don't know. So, um, when we wish somebody, uh, healing, we're saying, I hope you pull up the hardest, darkest parts of yourself and, purge them and release them and see that you don't need them. You know, that, I, yeah, that's in theory, a wonderful thing to wish for somebody. Right. But she's also on a biking trip with her dad. <laughs> so I would offer when I want to wish someone well, like let's say somebody's like, Oh, I'm sick. Or someone's like, can someone send me energy or whatever it is. I ask God to send, to create just a bubble of divine love, which is pink, universal pink energy. Mm -hmm. And I send it to them. And I don't even put it on them. I send it to them. With the intention, if they seek it, it comes to them. Not everybody needs divine love. I mean, I think everyone needs divine love, but... Some people need to be robbed of it in order to see the need for it. So I create, I don't, I really never put things on people. I put things near them. I used to, as a kid, I would say, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing in your general direction. It's okay. I'm not sending anything at you. I'm sending things toward you. So in the sense of the child at the school, what did you send toward the child or the school specifically for people that are struggling, that are in that darkness? I didn't send anything. I asked oh. all energy within this container to be transmuted into its optimum vibration. Okay. So you can't really, you don't know what that is for them. It's not up to us. I don't want to know. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I also don't want to know what color underwear you're wearing. I'm not wearing any. Oh, cool. Me I neither. <laughs> if you want to talk about it that's a whole other story yeah i'll totally talk to you about it but it's it's not my job and the part of myself that thinks i know what someone else needs or what it might be 
is ignoring the part that is just filtering it through me. I'm just seeing me. I can't see in you what isn't in me, what isn't in some way in me. Now, fortunately for you and all I work with, I believe everything is me. <laughs> so I don't resist any part of it. So if I'm working with somebody and they come to me, the only parts I struggle with is when someone comes to me and they're like, I absolutely love you unconditionally with no need. And I just want to love you. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck to do with that. That bugs me. I'm not comfortable with that. It scares me. I don't know what to do with that. And that's because that's my wound. That's a wound in me. So I, I, that's one of the places I will struggle when people come and approach me because I can't see that within me. That's a, that's one I struggle with right? as an example. So I have a lot of people right now wanting to just love me unconditionally. Super uncomfortable. But this is what I'm learning and working through right now. So even for myself, I'm not, I generally, I don't use the violet flame very much anymore. Um, I, especially not for me. Uh, for me, I tend to, uh, once I left the abusive marriage that was really hard and full of constant conflict and constant challenge, I used it a lot there. But I don't use it very much now anymore. Um, mostly I use it if somebody I know is having problems or struggling uh, or a student, I use that with students. Um, things like that when you guys are asking for support or help or I know that you're having a hard time um, and even in that I don't ask to take away what your hard time is just to bring it into optimum you know for you what is optimum uh, and that could be anything right that could be an accelerant all the way to breaking again I don't know I don't know <laughs> I'll let you know when I'm done breaking. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's still things to break uh, within us. I'm and, just so tired of being in fear about money and just like being enough in anything I do. I just, I want to be okay with where everything is. I want to be in my fun space. I want to be a different, I want to be different. Well, right now I'll tell you, um, well, let's just do something real quick. Uh, use your compass really quickly and just ask, is my fear around money only mine? No. Am I holding, has, what? I feel like everyone has the same fear. It's everywhere. It's collective. Isn't it's it a sad? collective and it's really intense right now. I'm going through it and I'm like, on this edge too. Financially, I'm like, oh, okay. I'm gonna be really sure. so am I. I have like nine washes in my account to my name right now. Can't fill my car. Like, I'm like, I can't now. I don't have a phone. I can't work. I'm like, why is this testing me right now? Well, I will offer this. You have been on roller skates since I met you. What do you and mean? I, well, as far lots of things going on, always having busy, oh. this, then this, then this, then oh, this, no. then this. Yeah, roller skates. Uh, and, and oh, I used to live that way. Um, I was always all every, every minute of every day was scheduled, you know, um, and I'd maybe get enough time for me, uh, maybe. Um, and I didn't even really want time for me cause I didn't know what to do with that time. Uh, <laughs> That's how I feel all that. Yeah. So, um, that was very much for me. And, uh, and, and, and anytime I'm avoiding myself, money stuff comes in the way because then what I, my response to, I don't have enough money is I'm just going to hang out and be here. And that's what I needed in the first place. I'm just going to hang out and be here. So that for me, um, and I'm right now in that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not down at $9, but I am like, okay, I need to make sure I stay above, my balance needs to stay above for my rent to be able to pay, be, pay my rent next month. Uh, because if my ex chooses to not send me the money on the day rent gets pulled out, I, I, I want to make sure that's there. Yeah, it's, so, it's, I hear you, it's like, um, I'm just, I'm working enough just to pay my bills and I'm not yeah. doing anything else and I'm just feel like I'm kind of spinning my wheels 
and this feels also to me like um, it's part of our purging of the old system too. You know, it's this, um, the old system of work hard to earn. If, if you don't work hard, you didn't earn it. Um, the, uh, and, and that your worth is, is in your, in your, in your wealth, you know, um, these things are, are coming up really strong collectively. Everybody is kind of having this collectively come forward. So people like us who ride the forefronts of waves or who hold our larger volumes of energy, uh, they will feel it more. So uh, grounding, that's what Marie was just talking about, was grounding is the best way to um, relieve that pressure of the collective. She talked about doing grounding, you know, just very much like we, what we do. Um, her technique was to visualize yourself on the sand at a beach uh, and then feel roots going down from your feet, feeling those roots spreading wider and deeper. Then to have a grounding cord come from your tailbone down and look, imagine yourself looking at the sand and seeing your grounding cord dropping into the ground and your feet so rooted they're almost down into the sand. Feel that grounding cord drop all the way down to the heart of Gaia. Each breath, breathing in and exhaling, driving it deeper. Full breath in. Exhale, driving it deeper. Full breath in, final drive all the way to the center. And now imagine that earth is coming up before you and it's like a great big exercise ball and you're hugging that exercise ball and ask Gaia to hug you back. And in that embrace, you're growing lighter and brighter. and returning back to just you. Thank you. You're welcome. I know everything's okay. It, it will be, and there'll be parts that aren't gonna be okay because those parts have to change. And that yeah. too is okay. I feel like, thanks. Do you ever feel like um, it's always bubbling under your surface? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is this week has been exceptionally challenging. I have been on the phone with my mother like twice this week, going, "I'm so anxious. I can't take it. I don't know what." It, yeah, I'm there. Like I, I yeah. Well, I feel like it's um. That's <coughs> me though. It's that um. You know, like. It's just my choice to like look at it and take the lid off. It's always, always there. Just yeah. wait for me to go there. Exactly. Um, and, and the reason it's always there waiting for you to go there is because when you go there, you go there with the intention of, I don't want to be here. And, uh, and you are in rejection of that space, right? It's like, um, it's kind of like, we don't think of healing, uh, uh, to be a powerful healer, you don't, you don't even think of healing in terms of healing, because healing implies there's something wrong in the first place, and you're fixing it. So every time we say, I want to heal something, we're saying, I have something broken, and I want it fixed. And in the future, maybe it will be fixed, because that's what the healing will maybe do. 
in the now, the now, the reality is this is broken. So um, you can watch a video um, in China, there's a clinic that has no medicine. They don't do surgery. It's a hospital and they only use energy work. Uh, and they document everything with um, MRIs. Uh, uh, um, the word's leaving me. Uh, uh, with a baby, ultrasound, <laughs> ultrasound, uh, x rays. Um, and so you can watch, they will do things like um, you can watch them heal bones, you can watch them dissolve tumors. Uh, and they do it within a matter of uh, five to 20 minutes usually. And how they do it is they all are chanting a word at this person. And, um, and I forget exactly what the word is, but it's a Chinese word that implies perfect perfection. It's like, it's perfect, perfect body, perfect body. And so it's not kill the tumor, kill the tumor, right? It's not fix the bone, fix the bone. It's uh, perfect health, right? It's perfection. It's, it's, a, different, it's a different approach that we take. Um, Bentinho Massaro talked about it in terms of, um, you know, he, he would say um, people asking, I, uh, I'm, I'm seeking abundance or I'm seeking my partner or I'm seeking this. And he goes, oh, well, when is seeking? When's that going to happen? Is that tomorrow in tomorrow land? Tell me when you get there. You know, so um, I have abundance. I have what I need. You answered my next question. Yeah. So um, when I'm working on trying to heal things, I am, I am healthy. I am strong. You know, uh, sometimes when I get up to go upstairs, you know, like stare my knee with my knee pain or whatever, I'll just kind of feel old and like, oh God, and I'll find myself like, oh, just like lumbering up the stairs. And, and I remember there was this one day where I was doing that. I'm like, I'm probably making this worse right now than it actually is. And so I decided with each step, I, what, what did I say? Um, I'm healthy and spry. I'm healthy and spry. And so I just said that each time I took a step. And by the end, I was running up the last few steps and I felt great. You know, uh, so that's the most powerful way to really create those changes for us. I think. It's difficult for me to sometimes not overcommit myself still. Oh, for sure. Do you feel with that yourself? Um, I used to. It used to be a huge, huge problem for me. Um, I, I now manage my life um, by my day planner. And I picked this day planner because it's got a, only a certain amount of space, right? I only have so much space. So I can't fit a bunch in here. And once I start wanting to fit more than a few things in a day, I'm like, oh, just a lot. And then my day is here. I, I see my week. Is this how I want to spend my week? Do, do I have a day in here that's mine? Or do I, oh shit, no. Every day in this week is not mine. I know for myself, if I'm going to be okay, I need a day that's mine. So you know what ended up happening? Well, I just pretty much took Tuesday none of you showed up for energy lab which was great because i wasn't even here i was passed out and I also, took, I also took wednesday um and i also took a uh, part of thursday so giving myself permission to not complete what's on here huge um the other piece that was big for me is recognizing my job is it managing others disappointment So um, I have to I have to manage my own disappointment, not theirs. So if I need to say no to something or cancel something, and the only reason I'm saying yes is because I don't want to hurt their feelings, I don't want them upset, I don't want them to feel whatever, and I'm not listening to me. And and I know that if I show up at those things, yeah. 
I'll make all those people super happy. They'll feel great. I will walk away and I will feel like shit. And I know that I will probably feel even maybe sick, you know, afterward. So I, I've just had to learn this, you know, um, I'm, I'm what, like six, six, seven years down this road from you, like you're 34. We as women are 35. We as women have been taught to uh, put everyone's needs ahead of our own. It is the hardest thing for us to culturally break away from, as well as experientially break away from, as well as genetically break away from. It's just interesting because the last time I, the thing that's in my mind, and I hear you and I agree, and it's, it's been a process for me even just to get here, realizing this, right? I'm still not where I want to be. It's like, I wanted to see this woman that I had done mushrooms with before. And then I had that spontaneous regression the next day. And I was in that sadness. I've told you about this. And part of me wants to commune with her and do music with them and hang out with them. And they live two hours away and they're having a big, like medicinal uh, gathering on Saturday at 12. And Hopefully I'll have my phone back by then. I don't have her number. I can let her know via Facebook what's going on with all that. But it's like, why does this happen? Is it because I need to be with myself? Is it because I'm overcommitting myself? And why do I not want to do that drug right now? Because I'm sort of like, I don't want to get that fucked up for the next eight hours and then not be able to work on Saturday or handle all my shit. It's like, it's almost like that particular drug is so... I was high the next day, the whole day, the next day and crying and like all this shit. So part of me is like, yeah, that might be good for me, but it also might be really distracting. And why am I, why did I Have lose you my tried checking in with your compass about these things? Not enough, but I lost my debit card two days ago at the bunk bar. Like, well, I didn't lose it. I just forgot to close it when I went upstairs to talk to this guy that has a studio there. I just totally forgot to close my tab out. So my debit card's gone. My phone crashed on me last night on my way back from Roberts. I was going to Roberts to talk to them about building my tiny home, which could be done a year from now if I get on this and I prioritize it and I pay off my debts related to my car and just keep working my ass off toward these goals. And at that point, I have to be out of here next year. I can move into my tiny home, which is a big goal of mine. I know. And I also want to make a record and all these things. So it's like, how do I prioritize and not drive myself crazy? Cause I'm so ambitious. I'm so lofty with all my stuff that I want to do this year. And on top of that, I have this girlfriend's relationship that I'm trying to also manage. So balance is so hard for me with everything that I'm feeling, experiencing. It's really kind of the thing that I need to learn the most is time management, being better at creating things that I can, that I can invest in long-term that are going to pay me all these aspects that I'm aware of. And I'm also overwhelmed and daunted by, because it's a lot for me to manage by myself. So I'm just like, maybe I should just stay home, but she's going to be sad. And I, I'm going to be sad. Like I do want to go there, but I'm also like, I don't think I want to do these drugs right now. <laughs> you know? But why? It sounds to me like um, you may have lost your debit card and your phone just so you'll have enough things that make it inconvenient for you to go because you would, with your desire to um, meet her expectations and also you, your old expectations uh, uh, of what healing looked like, um, and now you're being forced to feel like you can't do anything, right? My body is so tired. Yeah. I think that that, yeah, absolutely. I think that's also I mean, to me, if you were going to go and I, I'll, I'll just be totally frank and honest. I think it would be a horrible idea for you to be, uh, going and doing something, especially like that, because you're not going to be holding just you, you would be holding that whole group there. Exactly. And it wouldn't even be about your healing at all, honestly, exactly. as far as where you're at in your vibration. That's and what happened the last time I was there and why. Yeah. That and that's why they all want you there. Is it? Not consciously. People don't invite me to parties 
that, I mean, I'll be real with you. Like people, when they want me to come to things, it's because they want me to make it what I, to make it what I do. You know, um, I very rarely get invited to things anymore now. Very, very, very rarely because I won't do that anymore. And in the beginning, I used to be just all the time, constant, everyone wanting me to do this with them, go through that with them. And it wasn't, the only thing that shifted was me stopping holding people. And when I stopped holding them and started holding me, that all went away. So um, now I, I mean, I get invited to some things, but it's a, totally different feeling you know i don't feel like i have to go i don't feel like um uh and and i use my compass if i feel confused is this for me you know uh this is very very rare the, and the people who would ask me for that they don't anymore you know now it's different they come to me in a different way um so like uh, my observation of you has just been that you know you're not on your service list you know your 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 goals are very important to you yes but they also are a way you use to distract yourself from you know this inside and there's a lot there that you're going to have to eventually tap into and the only way you're going to do it is on your own in your own space in that quiet and i mean that's the worst. I'll be real. I hate that. That's, we call that the dark night of the soul, you know, and it's not just one night. Usually it's something that we have to kind of tap into at different points in our life. Um, and you know, for me, God, there's some nights where I want to crawl out of my skin and it's like, I don't, I just don't even want to be in my bed. I don't want to be here. I want to talk to somebody. I want to go do something. I mean, I'm not saying that, that this is going to go away entirely for you. This is, this is just part of it it's it's our desire to be part of that collective but right now we have to clear out and and address the parts internally that prevent us from from being a, a healthy part of that collective you know uh, one of the things that's been coming up a lot for me um you know is the forest people the squatches um they've been a, a big part of my training and my growth and development. Um, and, a, and a huge part of that is because they're a collective consciousness. So when I joined that collective, I had to start dealing with the chaos of my mind because it's kind of like sitting in a room and talking constantly when other people are trying to have conversations. So when you're in collective consciousness, all of your, unconscious feelings emotions beliefs thoughts that is right there for them so what like they would do things like tell, they would t cut me off from the collective at points when i get too far gone in that they'd isolate me they'd create these little sound bubble spaces maybe like you're really that's a lot of information and you'll hear this too from galactics when you start connecting with the galactics they the the fear that we have around them and the fear of aliens and our programming and all of that they're like god you're really uncomfortable to connect to that's one of the huge reasons they don't connect to us very much consciously so this is just stuff your your reality is forcing you into seclusion i'm sorry <laughs> And you're you're welcome. <laughs> it's it's that's the healing, you know. And I think you've been asking for it. And um and other people are like, I've got it for you. I got it for you. Here I got it for you. You can get it from here. And it it won't work from that way. Thanks. You're welcome. Now, when when you're ready for things like that. It will be your highest excitement to go do that. It's not going to be laced with should I or all these other things. And as far as you're prioritizing all the things in your life, the only things that make it in this calendar are my excitement. 
you know, I mean, I, my excitement is my kid. So the top of my calendar is I got him this week or I don't, you know, and then, then it's my work. I love my work. Labs are in here. Classes in here. Sessions are in here. I love that. Those are things that are passionate for me. Writing is passionate for me. Writing days are in here. Music is passionate for me. Music time is scheduled. These two days devoted to music. These three days devoted to work. And, and that's how I navigate that. That's how I manage that. I have some practices I do every day. I practice my guitar every day. That's what I do before I get up out of bed after meditating. My guitar is next to my bed that I practice with. I set myself up for it in advance. So when I wake up in the morning, oh, it's there. My calendar is the last thing I look at in the day. And the first thing I get up, I check my calendar. I make sure I know what my day is today. Yeah. And especially when I had to get better about time management. Now I have a partner who each morning and each night, he's like, so what's your plan for today? And what did you accomplish today at the end of the day? Because I want my partner to support my growth and development. That's, that's critical to me. And so I have a partner who's like, what's on your plan today, babe? What do you need to do? How are you going to organize it? He's, he's not doing anything for me. He's just reminding me, helping me structure that. He also growth and goal oriented. And he's very busy, you know. So we really only get small amounts of time with each other because also I have a lot of things I have to accomplish. I want. I want to record, I want to write, I want it to get published, I want to build my portal. These are huge things for me. And they take up a lot of my time. So my partner, it's really good for me that he lives on the other side of the world. And the only time we have time together is at the beginning and the end of our days. And even then, maybe not, you know. Because I wanted to get out of the idea that love is my solution. I didn't want ever again to feel like my job is making my partner happy. Because I, I lived that for 16 years. I'll, I won't do that again. In fact, I, I want to make sure that person is fully capable of being happy and self-contained with or without me. That's a partner I can hold and can be held by. And in nine months, I've never once had him you know, need me to support him through some big thing. He's supporting me through some big thing right now. And, and the way that we support each other, it's, it's, um, it's different. I struggle. I want more. Like, I'll be like, God, I feel like we never talk anymore. We don't get time. He's like, when do you want to do that? You know, do you want, you were, you were gone all yesterday and that was my day off and you had a lot of stuff on your schedule. I'm like, yeah, I know, but you're the one who's always, you know, I get that way, but that's because I have issues around being loved. So recognizing the issues that we do attract in our partners, those are for us too. You know, my partner is ultra independent, ultra independent. And he's like, you know, in order to get him to see when he does need something, it's like, it's really hard. But that's because that's how I am too. <laughs> right. And I'm used to being like, here, let me just give this to you. Let me give this to you. I can't, I can't do it for him right now. So I watch him run himself down to nothing because he takes care of his life and his people and his life. And he doesn't have any personal needs. I'm like, shit, that's totally what I do to myself. 
So I, it's not like it's perfect. There's problems, you know, and I'm seeing those too, but just recognize right now, everything is pushing you to this self introspection, this, this time right now. And that's a gift really, you know, though it doesn't feel like it. One thing that helps me too is, um, and this is something Suzanne worked with, I worked with Suzanne a lot on. So you have three, three main things that you're working, your work, uh, music, and building your home, is that right? Mm -hmm. So I work with clipboards. This is how I handle everything. I've got my music clipboard, I've got my work clipboard, I've got my client clipboard, um, I have my clipboard of writing, um, and those clipboards, uh, they're on my desk, right? And so if I know I want to work with some aspect of it, that's what I put on top. But it's a tangible thing that I can work with, right? So um, for you, uh, I get a sense it would be a little different because your work, the way you work is different. So it may be being like a calendar, a big wall calendar, you know. Yeah. Okay. And organizing, maybe not like... I'm not rigid with my calendar either. You know, there's times I don't do things on it. There's times that I don't accomplish stuff, but I, I give myself a loose plan for things. So um, whether it's like setting up the morning time for certain aspects of self-development or growth or practice or setting up evening time for that, like this is my time for that. When I wanted to build that for myself, I started doing Morning Oasis, which was that an hour program every morning from nine to 10. Um, and every morning I did it, no matter what, no, was it nine to 10 or 10 to 11? No, I can't remember, but I did it every weekday morning, except for ones where I was on vacation or my kid was in the hospital with a broken arm. Uh, and and I, I did that for me, like to commit to me, that this hour of showing up is me every day, that I can have that discipline, that I can have that commitment, then this hour is my self-meditation as well. You know, it's part of my own healing as well. Mm -hmm. And so... Any YouTube videos live for people that wanted to tune in? Is that what, if I'm getting this correctly? I was broadcasting on Facebook Live every day for an hour. People would join in. People would ask questions. They do. I do some card pulls. It was three card pulls, uh, channeled advice, and then uh, meditation healing, and um, every time. And it'd be in some structure of that, basically. And I did it for a year. My main intention was for my students. A lot of my students who were in life mastery were like telling me all the time, "You don't understand. It's too hard to meditate every day." And I'm like, well, "Okay, well." let's build a practice, then I'll do it with you, you know? And so that was how it started. Uh, and it built, it did so much for me in so many ways. One, it showed me, um, I don't need to pre-plan what I'm going to say. I can open my mouth and out comes what I need. You know, I can trust in that for myself. Uh, I can trust that I, I, what I need to work on is going to be shown to me, right? Um, I don't know what each energy lab is going to be about. And I once upon a time would have probably scheduled it out and structured it out. I did that with Morning Oasis in the beginning. Um, and very quickly that, you know, around, you know, episode 110 was like, fuck that, you know. So I'm not going to do that. Now, can I trust myself? Can I trust that I'm of service? Can I trust that I'm of value? And of course, there were days where I'm like, what the fuck am I even doing here? Why am I doing this? Some days there'd be like five people in there. Some days there'd be, um, you know, like 2000 people. So it, I never knew what to expect. I never knew how it would go. I had to just show up, commit to showing up. Uh, and what that did was it made me commit to my weekdays being work days where I didn't have that structure before, you know? So weekdays became my work days. And I worked for the morning. I worked from the time Spas left from school until he came home from school. And my, my time off was my afternoons when Spas was home. So it built, it built structure for me. So finding ways to build structure for yourself, very powerful when we're self-driven and self-motivated and work for ourselves. We've got to do that. We have to create that for ourselves. Sure. I feel like that part is, 
I'm too structured. I feel like it's, I get daunted by my own structuring, you know, like um, I'll just give up. I'll be like, God, I have so much to do today because I put it off for whatever reason. And now it's all hitting the head or I booked 7,000 gigs this week or whatever. And now I, you know, it, it's like, uh, I overwhelm my self with my ability to structure and i get it it helps my masculine move through the world but i find well, then that you like, need to learn to destructure it yeah be like she's just like i don't i want to wing this now like i want to wing it because i'm so sick of structuring mm -hmm. anyway you know and it's funny because you know the phone thing there was a moment and i and i heard it and it was like your phone's gonna you need to get that phone claim done Laura and I put it on my list to do that day it was like the l only thing I didn't do that day <laughs> I booked all these other gigs and did all these things that I could have done the next day instead of listening to that little voice that said file the claim and get that new phone sent to you and even Lauren brought it up a week ago like all your shit is in that phone Laura you that's a priority and I was like I thanked her I'm like yeah you're right I put it off and then I was just like, how long is it going to be until it craps out? And I heard two days and I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> I didn't believe myself. I didn't want to believe that voice that it was going to be two days. And it was two days, Jesse. Yeah. It crapped out. So what if, how about this? You right now you're beating yourself up for it. Of course. Right? I do. Well, how about this? How about this was like the best, most perfect example and illustration for you that you actually can believe yourself. But how do I delineate between the voice that says, ha ha, yeah, right, being the truth and the voice that says two days? Okay, that well, let me just ask you. <laughs> when, when, when you heard the two days, could you tell that that was truth? No, no. that's what I'm saying. So when you heard the two days, your immediate response was, no, not really. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> like, like, yeah. And I haven't backed up my phone, so I'm, I'm losing everything, by the way. Yeah, it's one of those. <sighs> yeah. My picture, so, video, my photo, naked photos, everything's awesome shit that I've gotten from my girlfriend. Like, you know, just to name a couple things off the top of my list. Memes I've saved, you know, just... <clears throat> well, what I would offer is this is an opportunity for you to figure out how to discern between those voices. It's so, my well, okay, so what did it Problem. feel like? I just don't know which one is. Well, it's pretty, to me, I would offer that um, the, <laughs> the first thing that comes through is our truth. The rest is our response to it. Whoa. I've never heard that. It's kind of like, you know, your first impression of people. It may be a little off, there might be something wrong, but usually you can tell if you like someone or not right away. And oftentimes, I don't know about you, but even if I, I realize I'm not gonna like this person, I'll try to like them. And I'll try to be their friends and I'll try to find things about them that are good. And I'll, it's like, I'll try to make other people like them. And it's like, but you can hear their thoughts and they're all their thoughts are just like awful self-loathing thoughts. And then I can't hang out with them. No matter right. how I want to try to like them. I can hear their own thoughts. Yes. So for you, I would offer, it's time to just observe your response to things. I think that um, for me, I know for me, like a per here's a perfect illustration of this. I was cooking one day, I looked up and I noticed the butter dish, which was on top of the fridge, was actually resting on top of the fridge and or the freezer door. Like here's the freezer door and here's the fridge. And I was like, oh, you should push that back. But I was cooking for a dinner party and I had a lot of stuff to do. And I was like, okay, I'll do it when I go back over to that part of the kitchen. Yeah. And then I thought, again, I noticed it. Oh, you should push that back. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I, I just kept not doing it, even though I knew I needed to do it. But I heard it three times. 
And then unconsciously, I needed something from the freezer and I opened it up and down comes that butter dish. It gets broken and the war, it was a summer day. So the butter inside was really, really soft. When it hit the counter, it splattered everywhere. So now I have a dinner party and my kitchen is covered in butter. I can't walk across it anymore. I'm not even done cooking yet. I get it. I struggled trusting my own intuition. I still do on some things. I mean, like I have a keel. I've never been loved as much as this guy loves me, honestly. And in moments, there's moments I let it in and I feel it and I'm like, <gasps> yeah. Right. And then that makes me close up. And then I sit there going, I don't know. Does he really love me? Is this even real? I don't know. Same thing that you do in my own way. Yeah. Because it's, because it's, you know, what does that come with? What is the expectation around how someone wants to be loved back if they're loving you and looking at you as their dream girl? Yeah. Does that come with some amount of responsibility, accountability? Only if you think it does. I don't know. I, well, and they may have that. <laughs> right, I'm going to say they probably have that. Uh, so yeah. obviously, even we're all programmed with our own expectations of what mm. love. I had somebody tell me once, he was like, Jesse, the thing I love about hanging out with you is you don't have any expectations of me. And I said, well, that's not true. He goes, <laughs> what? I mean, I've never seen him look more terrified. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, I just told him the worst thing I could ever tell him that I have an expectation of him. And I said, you're just comfortable with the expectations I have right now. Like we all have them no matter what, even if we try. Oh. Not. Yeah. But this is the thing too. I think that with women, it's like we, a lot of us need to feel needed to feel loved. So we, I would say we, I would offer... It's not that we need to feel needed. It's not that we want to feel needed. It's that we want to feel wanted. You know, need is a little different. I think, I think men need to feel needed. They need a job. They need a task. I feel like it's hard for me to, like with Lauren, I'm happy to help her and I love her. I wanted to help her a lot and I did. And I didn't want to see her stressed and all these things. And so I... I let our time become me helping her get settled. And I think as a result, I was sort of pushing back and like pushing away because I'm like, I'm exhausted. Like, I really can't keep giving on the same level. I need to get something back that feels at least like she's not always, like she's not afraid to ask for help, which I love because I won't, you know what I mean? So I think that's great. And I'm also like, it's up to me to be like, no. And that's the part that's hard. I can't like put it on her because people are always going to be like asking me for help if they need it. And that's great. Whatever. I do the same thing in some scenarios when it comes to music, I guess a little bit with people that I'm like playing music with like, Hey, can you promote this show or something like, but that's very rare. But anyway, I just, I don't want to resent her or myself because I'm not very good at setting my own boundaries. And I think that that kind of, as a result of that happening, I start to just pull away a little. And I don't really know exactly, Jesse, like how much your time you're supposed to spend with somebody, you know, like a day or two a week, like if they want to see you more pop in for five minutes, like I have no idea how, what's healthy in a relationship. I think it's, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's I do. I actually was just asking a friend of mine who's never been married and who only dates because I've, I've been married. Right. So to me, I'm like, if you're in a relationship, that's an everyday thing. Like, I mean, okay, I don't know. To me, I'm just saying to me, cause I was married, right? I lived with my mar our husband. I lived with my partner. Oh, I've, done that, that, I've done that, not marriage, but yeah, I get yeah, it. Yeah. And so before that, I've, I've always like, I was married for 16 years before that I was single for six months. I was in a committed five year relationship living with someone before that. Uh, my entire adulthood has been living with somebody. So with Akil, I'm like, okay, I need to be healthy about this because I'm all like, I haven't heard from you in an hour and it upsets me. And I'm like, it's ridiculous. It feels crazy to feel that way, but it does happen. If I know he's awake and I know he's doing stuff, I'm like, God, what are you doing? You know, and I get that. And I hate being the clingy girl. Like 
And I've never been that before. Normally it's the other way. The other people are coming and wanting me and my attention and my time. And so this is a total reversal for me. It's the first time being in this part of it. And I've, I've been having to ask my friends for advice on that. I'm like, is it normal to not hear from someone that you're dating for a couple of days? Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, that's totally normal. And I was like, huh, it feels awful though. Yeah. And she's like, she's like, well, I guess it just depends on why, you know, it just depends on why you're not hearing from them and how much are they committed to you. And Did you, you know, about this? like you guys do meet, do you have weekly meetings about how the relationship's going in those ways, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just like, so with Akil, you know, one of the things with him that's great is that um, he notices when I'm feeling off and he forces me to talk about it right away. Uh, so um, and for him, because he's so independent and he always takes care of everybody else and feels like nobody really loves him and needs him. Uh, for him, when I'm all like the clingy needy girl and I'm like, I just feel like I haven't talked to you and blah, blah, blah. And I feel really blah, blah, blah. To him, he's like, this lets me know you do love me because it's hard to feel from you. Mm. You're really protected. Mm, that's kind of, I feel like I'm like you in that way. So he's like, he loves getting to see that part of me that feels those vulnerability, that insecurity, that kind of need, because he's like, I know that no one else sees this. And I'm like, yeah, nobody, no, nobody sees this. Yeah. I'm shocked I'm even doing it, <laughs> you know? And so, but for him, like if I, if he feels that I'm off and I'm not sharing that with him, then he, then that feels, then he's like, what's going on here? you know, uh, and he is extremely sensitive. If I start to pull away emotionally, he knows right away, you know? So that's also good for me because I'm trying to learn. I don't have awareness of that. I get distracted by things. So I don't notice that I'm emotionally disengaged in the, in that dynamic. Uh, so instead now I've got a partner who's like, Hey, I notice it. Hey, Hey, and, you know, vice, that's kind of what Lauren's doing for you. Now, as far as, like, need goes, you know, um, for me, I'll be totally honest. There's some triggers for me in your guys' dynamic. Um, there's, uh, it's, there's, there's some components to dating women uh, that I really struggled with, and it's why I didn't date women in general. Um, we are very needy and clingy and like we t we just have more of that in us but it's really that we are more interconnected you know um women the first part of our brain that develops is the frontal lobe for males it's the rear lobe uh the the rear brain so for women it's all associative i'm looking at your face i'm reading your energy i'm checking where you're at i'm in your community you know it's like that's all female um and that's heavy and like, I like, I really like to just not be observed sometimes, you know, so um, that that's hard for me. And I noticed that the two of you are, are very, when you're together, you're like, where's she at? Where's she at? Where's she at? Where's she at? And, and not so much, where am I at? And so that's, that, that would be one thing I would offer would be really helpful for you when you're in engagement with your partner is where am I at? You know, and that's what I keep trying to do. Like I'll tell Akil, I am feeling anxious and nervous right now. And I really want to talk to you because you make me feel better. And so I am going to just like meditate right now. And he'll be like, okay, baby. <laughs> because if I do not implement this, what's happening? It's like I'm giving too much or she's giving too much to satiate how one another, you know, like what's the. It's too much. You know, in the beginning, when we first, like with Akil and I, when we first uh, came together, Jesus, we couldn't stop talking to each other. And at first I was overwhelmed by it. And he would be like, he'd want to know what I was doing all the time and where I was going. And it was his slow time, right? It was, his work was slow at that point. Mine was busy. Mine was amping up at that point. So, uh, you know, uh, he wanted to talk a whole lot more. And I would be like, he would always be waiting for me to get done with someone over or me doing something. He'd like w lay in bed until 11 o'clock in the morning because I'd have someone here till 11 o'clock at night, you know, and he'd be like, when are you done? You know? And so 
that was hard in the beginning, but then I became the one who was like, okay, now I need that. And he's like, yeah, but now I, I told you I'm going to get busy in January and I'm going to be busy till June. And I'm like, wow, that's six months of busy. <laughs> Still me, you know? And so he reminds me a lot. He's like, it's, well, it, let, I'm just your husband that's working abroad. You know, I'm, 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 I have to work abroad and many people in the world do this. So we have to find ways. And, and, you know, um, and so it's, it's negotiating. There isn't a right and a wrong way. There isn't a right amount of communication or wrong amount of communication. It's the negotiation. It's the vulnerability, you know, yeah, like, like I'm, I'm so exhausted. I'm so tired. I can't give you this right now. This is what I need. Yeah. I'm saying it instead of being passive, exactly. I feel like I'm the strong one that can fix everything or I can. Exactly. You know, that's been a pattern in all my relationships with the women yeah. I've been in. And, and, and you'll pick so women who need to be fixed in order to make sure that pattern isn't, will continue until you stop fixing them. Sure, right. I mean, I don't really want to fix her, honestly. Good. I, then I stop trying to make sure she's settled, make sure she's happy. I mean, here, she's on a trip with her dad, and you're sitting here worried about her trip? I'm not worried. I'm worried about how how the dynamics I've witnessed have transpired and how I'm feeling because she's away and I'm like, this is nice break actually. Yeah. Can finally not feel like I have to be like attentive and yeah. yeah. You know, and trying to examine that more and understand. One of the things yeah. I find is I set that expectation with my partners. You know, I, I show up over the top until I am spent and then I start forming a resentment for them. That's what I'm saying. I can yeah. already see it starting to happen on a very, very finite level, but I've expressed all this. I've communicated all this. We have really great communication around it, which gives me a lot of, you know, hope or like, you know, satisfaction to know that she's a person that can hear, grow, open, is open to yeah. feelings. And I also need to be better at getting in touch with my own feelings. Yeah, I would offer that that's the more right now it feels like that is the really important thing uh, is you, it's it's I would offer for you to start checking in with yourself. Um, is this in my highest excitement and uh, not to value those things, right? If it's not in my highest excitement, it doesn't mean I don't love this thing. It doesn't mean it's not valuable to me. It means that right now, energetically, it's not my alignment. That's all. You know, and there's some times where like, I will really want to talk to Akil and I'm just going to keep going back to the, oh, well, that's because that's what we're talking about. I'm like, why do I keep talking about my relationship? Um, but, uh, cause I don't like talking about my relationship, but I will, um, you know, there's some days where I'll really want to talk to Akil and, uh, and I, I know he's come home. I know he's exhausted. I can feel it. I can tell from his responses. And so I recognize I want to talk to him because I am feeling lack. I have to fill my own lack. And he's had to help me with this, by the way. He, and, and vice versa, too. He does the same thing when, he's, when he doesn't have things going on, you know. Um, and so, you know, he'll say, I, I, I'll be like, I really want to talk to you. And it's, you're not doing anything. And he's like, yeah, but I'm just, I need to just like, just sit and watch TV for a while. My brain's fried, you know. I'm like, oh, right, right. You've been all day in a wedding with all these people talking to you and taking pictures and constant noise. And of course, you just need to chill. Now I can choose to interpret that as I'm not chill time for you. Oh, I could go into victimhood and all of those things, right? But that's me avoiding the truth, which is I don't, I need to feel held right now and I'm not because I'm not holding me. And so, um, Akil has to, he gives me those opportunities. So if you can look at that, like with Lauren and you both, these are opportunities for you to practice that transitioning the expectation of the other to help, you know, to be that calm or whatever it is. And it's not, you know, it's not perfect. It's not easy. It's the process that you're going through and you're transitioning in what do I need from a partner? What do I want from a partner? You know, what do I want to be as a partner? What do I want to provide for them?
like I wanted to find, I, I still, it's hard watching Akil struggle. Like right now, financially, he's having a hard time um, because he's also doing a lot. Like he's completely rebuilding his house right now. His dad is sick and dying. So he's, he's working his ass off, taking every possible gig he can take. And he drove himself to the point where two weeks ago, he passed out at work and woke up in the hospital. Um, and they said, your body is fatigued, you know? And so it's like, we, we can drive ourselves to those points and, and, and ignore all the lessons, but we're gonna still hit the wall anyway, <laughs> you know? So don't worry about whether you're seeing it or not, the wall will come, you're just observing it now. And the attachment to making it work forever with Lauren uh, is where the fear comes from, the doubt comes from. What if, what if you let Lauren be your teacher for as long as you need her? and your, your partner, and, you know, as long as you need her. It's our attachment for it to be a forever thing, you know? Like, um, we don't know that. There is no guarantee of forever. Uh, Bashar says, humans are always trying to make somebody into their soulmate, thinking the soulmate is the one and only for the rest of their lives. And they believe a soulmate is the person showing up across from you right now. And then the next time someone shows up across from you, that's now your soulmate. So can we let them be that while they're there? These are hard ones. I'm not saying they're easy, they are hard. But this is some of the stuff I'm working on right now. Yeah, because if you don't approach it without that attachment, it's, it's like dirty, it's like, it's need. Yeah. How, how can anything be clean? And if you're showing up because you think that attachment's there, what are you showing up with? Right. I don't know. Expectations or um, fear. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there's some of that in there for her and me. I think that's kind of where we both are and why we attracted each other a little bit is because yeah. of that sense of a deeper desire to be met by someone to do yeah. that work with or to at least share life with yeah um, and wanting that so badly that you know we want to make each other into that for each other which i think is an honest um beautiful thing on one level and on another level it's fraught with these potential issues because we are where we are respectively and um you know she's open and yet I would say I wouldn't say she's seeking on the same levels that I am in the same ways if she's yeah. seeking, it's yeah. two different mediums yeah I mean Akil doesn't isn't um, energetically inclined he's very sensitive he's very intuitive he picks up things um, but he's not going to be going to a meditation circle anytime soon does that bother you that he's not wanting to be doing that stuff? No, it doesn't have to come in the same form. It doesn't have to be the same way. We can still teach each other a lot. And yeah, it's the. My it's world is that stuff. So having a partner that's not that, having a partner that doesn't expect me to be a teacher, you know, he makes fun of me. He's like, big teacher, nothing to know. You know, <laughs> he pulls me out of that space. Well, yeah. one thing that's hard for me with her is that I'm, I get it. And I'm, I'm this deep person. Yeah. You know, or at least the majority of what I project into the outer realms is that I want to have those deep conversations. I want to explore these things that aren't full of levity all the time. And she brings a certain levity to my life that I appreciate. And sometimes I've noticed it's, I'm too much for her. She doesn't want to always talk about things deeply and go into them. She just wants to have fun and laugh and, and be like, hey, we don't have to talk about this to this extreme depth right now, Laura. And I'm sure she's surrounded by enough shallow people, but that's who I am, you know, on a lot of levels. So it's like, how much more do I have to give? Is that a healthy thing for me to examine and observe and say, yeah, this is good for me to actually take a break from that part of myself that always wants to be in that 
depth? Um, or is it a sign that it's someone that really can't hang in those depths with me, doesn't want to hang in those depths truly with me, that's just skating through life, you know? Well, you know, I think that will reveal itself. Um, and uh, for me, um, Akil is capable of going into those conversational realms um, and blows my mind with what he reveals when he does. Uh, so for me, that is met, that part. But I, I will be honest with you, not being my ex, I couldn't do that with. And it was horrible. You know, um, all he wanted, he wanted everything to be fun and enjoyable and a good time. And, um, and when I would have something hard I needed to talk about, he'd give me um, enough sentences so he could get the gist of it. And as soon as he got the gist of it, he'd say, okay, Jesse, that's about all I can handle. You need to go talk to your girlfriends about that or your friends about that. Pretty bad. Yeah. I don't think Lauren would ever do that to me. I don't think she would either. Um, I, I, but I'm saying that for me, having someone who couldn't do that with me, couldn't go there with me was hard. Um, so just be aware of these things, be aware of the things and, and, you know, uh, I find that when we are engaged with someone, then there's, there's something there. When we're not engaged, we're done. Uh, and I trust that for myself. I've always been that way. As, if I'm still engaged with that person, there's things for me to learn. There's things for me to grow from. Uh, and if I'm done, I'm just, I'm done. And I know that. Uh, and I want to learn everything I can from the people that are in front of me so I don't have to repeat things. So I go all in. Uh, and that's just how I roll. That's how I roll with everything. Um, so uh, I, I used to have people say to me, you know, can you bring your happy down? You're too happy. You know, can you bring your this down? Can you, you know, uh, and it was like, um, no, I can't actually, you know. But it's, if I'm going to let you go, it's 12, I'm going to go eat. Um, uh, and I don't know, are you free tonight? You're going to come down for movie night? Yeah, I am. I would like to. I think yeah. that would be nice to hang out with you guys. Yeah, come on over and we'll do movie. <laughs> I'll make yeah, some popcorn. Okay, Is it, it's a potluck too, right? Yes, yeah, snack luck. Snack luck, that's right. Okay, cool. Um, so whatever and uh you know and if you don't end up bringing anything there's always plenty so yeah i'll bring something i i'm gonna get actually need to get a haircut so i'm gonna go get my hair trimmed at like 3 30 so uh, after that i'll come by all righty sounds good five right or is it seven the i open the house at five and the movie starts at seven cool i'll probably be there right at five then all right i'll see you then <laughs> See you then. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Bye.